So now will come one of these slaves of hand. So this is all obvious, right? And now I'll suddenly introduce an operator. Operator, we have a name of two dead white gentlemen, and uh, they'll be raised to some mythical status. And I'll do one dangerous thing while I'm doing it. Uh, as a physicist, you might not even bat an eyelash. But in case of mathematical training, you might worry. I'll define Perron Frobenius operator. I mean, it'll be just nothing. But the result will be that suddenly classical mechanics, or cl no, classical dynamical systems, of which classical mechanics is a special case, will suddenly look very much like quantum mechanics. Now, you know, why would I do such a thing? It might have troubled you at some point in your life is that they teach you statistical, well, classical mechanics and electromagnetism. Uh, and these are nonlinear equations, explicitly write them down. Uh, certainly classical mechanics is electromagnetism. You might have to think what's linear, nonlinear, but but when they teach you quantum mechanics, everything is linear, unitary operators, linear. So how is that? You know, why is it? Is it more fundamental, uh, quantum mechanics? And nonlinear physics just comes out of it? No, you know, it's just a trick which we find very useful, which is that we have a very powerful theory of linear operators. So what we do is we take a four-dimensional or three-dimensional, you know, six-dimensional phase space of a mechanical problem, and we trade it in for an infinite dimensional space of amplitudes, which is linear. And it turns out when you have linear things, especially if it's on a Hilbert space, we have very powerful machinery to compute things. And what's really going on is we are starting to introduce a duality between local and global. So we are starting to say mechanics describes what happens to every uh, initial point. But if you're interested in what happens to everybody, we have to start thinking globally, and that's a bridge to global thinking. And uh, how you do it, it's kind of silly simple. So consider what happens if I start someplace in my region I, I let evolution work. So every point in this volume in time t ends up someplace. Now, if our evolution is smooth, so we don't slice the world as we do it, uh, the result of this will be another cloud of points, which will have some other shape, but it will be con contiguous. So this is our M of I, and I can denote this whole thing as evolution of M of I. So evolution moves every trajectory, and this way it moves uh, a volume. And it's through this observation that much of the wisdom accrued in theory of continuous media in the 19th century, so uh, elastostatics and um, deformations and fluid mechanics, connects to dynamical systems. Because you realize that every trajectory is indestructible because of it's a diffeomorphism. Our law is such that every trajectory has unique future and most likely also unique past, depending on your dynamical system. But in finite dimensions, it tends to be a diffeomorphism. You can go back and forth. These guys are indestructible. In particular, no trajectory created. 
or destroyed. In deterministic dynamics, when we add noise, things change. We have that the volume over this space, a total mass, is the same as the initial volume. So this is density at time t, and this is the density at time zero. So far, I haven't put this time thing in, but if you start looking at density that's being transported by the flow, then we have to put a uh, time variable as well. Now, if flow is invertible, I can actually uh, relate this density dynamically, and I can write that this is an integral dx zero of the initial volume, this volume here, times rho, every trajectory propagated from the initial one, time t, and as I'm changing coordinates from here to here, I'll pick up a Jacobian, there'll be Jacobian ij, which is delta x, X at zero, delta X at T. So if I change my coordinates, I have to pick up a Jacobian, and this is determinant in our notation. We called it just J because this is a little bit too clumsy for us. Evaluate it starting at initial point. So we can actually rewrite evolution by only integrating over the initial volume, and it doesn't depend what this volume is, so we find the transformation law for the density, which says density time t is the same thing as density at original time, but divided by the volume, or determinant of the Jacobian, of the transformation going from there. Anyway, this makes sense. Uh, if Jacobian is one, density doesn't change. It happens to be, for example, uh, Hamiltonian and symplectic flows will be that. They'll have phase space volume preservation. If Jacobian is such that its flow is unstable, this is factor larger than one, this determinant, it means that the density will increase because we'll take the whole thing and we'll scunch it to a smaller volume. So if this is larger than one, I mean, all I'm saying, density varies inversely with the volume, and volume is controlled by the Jacobian. And now, just a little bit of magic, we rewrite this by inserting identity into this evolution formula. Density at time t is a linear operator, and I'll put t up here because the things sort of tend to go exponentially, so that's a matter of choice. You could put this time someplace else. Acting on the initial density, evaluate it at point x. which is integrate initial volume, take the initial density, and stick in a delta function, Dirac delta function. So I'm just writing this part of the equation as a Dirac delta function. So, you know, all I'm saying is it's this thing here. And the only thing we have to verify that we indeed we pick up this determinant. So this is just a way of writing this change of coordinates here. This thing will be called kernel, but I'll always drop the word kernel because it's too boring. Of 
the Peron Frobenius operator. Now, if you have only mathematical training and you have these states for Dirac delta functions, then everything I say will be in the books, but it's always written in this form. You know, they'll never write a Dirac delta function. But for us, it's convenient to write it because it'll provide very natural bridge both to stochastic and uh, quantum mechanics. To realize that the way that evolution is changing is that there is a linear operation, and because this is deterministic world, it says, this is x0, it says that if I start x0, I end up at unique point. So if I start here, I end up at unique point after time t. Unique point means Dirac delta function. When we start looking at stochastic processes, this might be a, a narrow Gaussian rather than a Dirac delta function. And in quantum mechanics, this will be called unitary evolution operator, Green's function, all kinds of other things. But that's all it is.